course, this was never going to be just about trade. It's mostly about politics. It's about the politics of the European Union, and that is the complicating factor in all of this. So they're playing more hardball than you expected then, perhaps? No, I think that the, the European Commission, in the first part of the negotiation, were always going to represent the interests of the 27 in a way that was fairly consistent. They were worried about the money, the citizens' rights, and so on. I think the second part of the negotiation, which is about the economic part, uh, will be much more diverse in terms of European views because um, countries have different trading relationships with the United Kingdom and, and will want to a greater or lesser extent to protect that. Um, now, I'm keen to touch on Boris Johnson's article that he wrote this weekend as well, uh, a bog roll Brexit uh, in his very colourful language, uh, warning of a kind of political no man's land, if you like, where we're half in and half out. He's right, isn't he? We're not heading towards the kind of Brexit that you always dreamed of either, are we? Well, what I wanted was that we were outside the single market and the customs union uh, and we were outside the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. Uh, that's where I think we're going to end up. Uh, if we do it slightly more slowly in order to minimise any disruption, that's fine by me. You know, having waited 40 odd years to leave the European Union, a few extra months uh, doesn't bother me. If, if we're getting it right. And I think it's really important that we, we get that, that deal right for Britain and we get it right for Europe. Uh, and I think that what's, what's really key to all of this is, is it a political Brexit or is it an economic Brexit for the people of Europe? That's the decision that needs to be made in the next few months. It's interesting listening to you because on the one hand you've got Boris Johnson warning about bog world Brexit and you've got yourself sounding you know, very diplomatic, very reasonable. And it kind of feels interesting because it feels to me as if when you were first appoint appointed, you were almost seen as the liability Brexiteer, you know, the kind of risk Brexiteer, if you like. But actually, compared to Boris Johnson and David Davis, you're perhaps the best behaved. What's happened? <laughs> well, we've got a big department to, to run. We've got to think about what happens after Brexit. Um, and, you know, it's, we really focus on, on the world outside Europe. And part of this whole debate, part of the problem has been that it's very Eurocentric. And if you look, at, for example, at Britain's trade, only 43% of our trade now goes to the European Union, where 10 years ago it was 57%. Uh, the rest of the world's growing more quickly. We need to think about Britain's place in the rest of the world and, and, and not regard Europe as the centre of the world. At, at the same time, though, that you kind of feel as if Boris Johnson and David Davis are shaping Brexit. Boris Johnson by writing these newspaper columns, kind of trying to swing government policy. David Davis by threatening to resign if his red lines aren't met. Do you not need to be a little bit more kind of bullish yourself? Do you think, or are you doing that in private? Well, I was being told yesterday that I was being too bullish by saying that the uh, Prime Minister wasn't bluffing when she said that, that no deal was a possibility. You know, we, there, we have to balance a number of things. Uh, one is we need to be pragmatic about how we actually achieve our exit. The other is to remind our European partners that we're not kidding, um, that we would walk away rather than accept a bad deal for Britain. Is that true? Would you really walk away uh, over the no-deal scenario? Yes, I think, uh, as I've said before, uh, our European partners would be foolish to believe that because the Prime Minister is very uh, considered, very, very pragmatic, that she's bluffing. None of us, including me, want no deal. Uh, I sincerely hope we get a good deal, and I think that's in the interests of the European Union as much as the United Kingdom. But if politics is put uh, ahead of the economic well-being and the long-term uh, well-being of the United Kingdom, uh, we would have to walk away. I just don't think that's going to happen, because I think ultimately the elected governments that depend upon trade and prosperity and growth and jobs uh, are not going to, to put the ideology of the European Commission ahead of the... Uh, prosperity of their own people. But at the same time, it's also not going to happen because you haven't got a parliamentary majority for it either, have you? So no deal isn't going to happen if you're being completely honest, is it? Well, you know, if we, if we, if we have not got a deal that's good for Britain, uh, if there's attempts to hold us inside the customs union or the single market, when the people of Britain decided to vote against it, then we, we'd, have to, we'd have to have no deal. But some and people will be listening to you saying this in a week where Airbus and BMW have warned of absolutely catastrophic consequences if there are no deal, and think, hang on, you're the one putting politics ahead of no. Um, economics. No, no, what we've said is we, we want there to be a deal. 
um, and it's in the interest of everybody uh, that there's a deal. So um, why don't you just take this no-deal scenario off the table? You haven't got a parliamentary majority for it. The UK is not ready for it. Look at Dover. The preparations haven't been done. Companies like Airbus are saying that they're prepared to delay investment or just not invest in the UK if it happens. So just to safeguard the jobs and investment in the UK, just take it off the table. Because it's a negotiation. If we actually say we'll accept any deal you give us, rather than walk away, that weakens our negotiating position. And people who are making these comments need to understand that they may actually be putting the UK to disadvantage uh, by making these cases. We've got to be free in a negotiation to say, if we don't get the deal that we want, there won't be any agreement. So do you think then that companies uh, like Airbus or indeed MPs who are pushing for uh, the no-deal scenario to be taken off the table are actually putting prosperity at risk then? I think that companies are right to, to say that if there's no deal, that wouldn't be good for Britain, but it wouldn't be good for Europe either. Will it be catastrophic? And the point, I, the point I make to them is that they should also be making the same case to European governments, um, that that will be bad for them. In an era where we've got complex integrated supply chains, uh, it will be necessarily bad for both sides. It's clear that you're sticking to your position on uh, no deal. So let's see if we can get a bit of clarity in other areas. Can you rule out any extension to Article 15? Uh, I think to keep Britain in the European Union would not be politically acceptable, wouldn't be acceptable to me. So no, no extension to Article 50 as well? Well, I wouldn't find that politically acceptable and I couldn't support it. Is it something that you might resign over? Well, everyone keeps saying, you know, what will you do if, if, if this happens? I'm saying it's not politically acceptable to me. And how about an extension of the transition period? Well, if the transition period um, had to be extended, for technical reasons, as we've discussed with the backstop, if, for example, one other country or was unable to ratify an agreement, or we didn't have technical means in place, and we already had the transition, and we already had the withdrawal agreement, and the future economic partnership already agreed, um, I wouldn't have a, a major problem with that as long as it was very time limited, and there was a unilateral mechanism for Britain. Uh, to pull out of it if we thought that we were being kept in the European Union against our will. So actually you could see a, a scenario if it was um, a, a, a time-limited extension to the transition? Well, if it was time-limited and Britain had a unilateral mechanism to end it, what we couldn't accept was any extension uh, to the implementation period um, that was under the control of Brussels, not under the control of London. Another big risk, of course, to Brexit is what's happening in America, uh, this kind of trade war, if you like, that seems to be at risk of being launched by uh, Donald Trump. Are you confident still that the UK will get a good deal with the US after Brexit? Well, you have to separate out the two things, um, and they're also done by two different bits of the US government. Uh, our discussions on future trading agreements with the United States are based on our mutual interests, you know, what would be good for both sides. Uh, we don't think that the the tariffs being applied by the United States are in the interests of both sides. So that's a separate, a separate issue. Uh, I spent the last couple of days uh, in Geneva at the World Trade Organization. There is real concern now that this could damage the global economy. If you start getting restrictions on trade applied by both sides on an ever escalating basis, then you will get potentially real damage to that global economy. That will do much more harm to, to Britain than anything that could come out of the Brexit process. Uh, if that were unsuccessful. Uh, this is a genuine threat to global growth uh, and that for a country like Britain that is uh, an open trading country could be extremely damaging. So we still hope that we can roll back from this. We understand a lot of the uh, analysis that the United States makes that, that about Chinese overproduction, about uh, problems with market entry, uh, forced technology transfer and so on. We also understand why the, the US is upset with NATO countries not carrying their share um, of defence spending and of course when Britain leaves the European Union we will uh, that brings that into sharp focus because when we leave the European Union EU NATO members will be carrying less than 20% of the NATO budget which is absurd. Uh, I understand all of those things but the way of going about it is not to apply tariffs. Have you had any assurances about tariffs in the UK? Well of course we are affected uh, by that by being members of the European Union and will continue to be members of the European Union. But, but when we leave when, you know, when we leave the European Union, do you think that we we'll still we have these tariffs slapped on us by this the is not This is not a European issue, and um, we have to try to stop seeing everything through a Brexit lens. This is a unilateral action carried out in what we believe is in breach of World Trade Organization rules. We believe in that rules-based system, uh, and we will stand up for that and the concept of free trade. And therefore, if we are forced into the position of taking countermeasures, in WTO law, then we will do so. 
Um, when it comes to trade deals, of course, um, it won't, it's not just the US that we're looking uh, at in the future. It's lots of other countries around the world, uh, big growth economies like India, for example. Would you be prepared to see a, you know, a relaxation of the visa requirements on these countries if it meant that we'd be getting good trade deals with them? Well, um, in movement of people is always one of the things that's considered um, in any trade agreement and uh, that would be something that we would look at in in a bilateral negotiation but remember it is a negotiation and you don't give your cards away at the beginning of that but you, in any uh, trade negotiation you have to recognize you're looking at a whole range of factors and when you get into those negotiations you decide uh, both sides will decide you know what's on the table and what's off the table so that's that's a long way away but it's on the table though that seems to be what you're it, saying it's it's a long way away because we are currently not looking at a free trade agreement with India in the near future. We're engaged in a, uh, a discussion with India on a trade review. We were looking sector by sector at our economies to see how we could get to within a closing distance that might enable us to have a free trade agreement, but we're not there yet. Okay. Um, now, I want to move on to a couple of um, other issues just before we uh, end. Um, one of those is those difficult votes that we saw in the House of Commons. Um, over the meaningful vote. Now, one of the things that will stick in people's minds, I think, is the sight of Nas Shah in a wheelchair with a sick bucket because Conservatives decided not to allow her to be simply nodded through. They wanted her to be in the, in the Commons chamber voting. You know, as a medical man, does that not worry you? Well, uh, the Labour Party make those decisions about who they bring in themselves and, and the whips um, make decisions amongst themselves uh, in uh, how that voting is going to go on. Um, uh, I've seen that before. I've seen it when John Major uh, had, had no majority. The, you, the Labour Party. With it? Well, the Labour Party. I remember the Labour Party at that time um, bringing people, Conservative MPs, having to come in by ambulance and um, from hospital to vote. I don't it think seems it, a ridiculous system, though, doesn't it? That, well, that this I, think, can I think to most rational people, it is a ridiculous system, and I think that um, we need to find ways to make to make that more acceptable. Is there a worry as well that you're kind of losing the viral war, if you like? You know forget the kind of very important kind of intricacies of a meaningful vote. What a lot of people will remember is the sight of that woman in the wheelchair. And it's similar to the upskirting, um, you know, um, being blocked by Christopher Choate. Is there a risk that because you're losing the kind of viral campaign to Labour, you could be seen as the nasty party again? No, I don't think that's true. I, I think what people will, will remember was that there was a very vibrant vote, that both houses considered the withdrawal bill, uh, and the government ultimately succeeded in delivering uh, what we're there for, which is to uh, carry out the voters' instruction to leave the European Union. Another vibrant vote coming up, of course, is the uh, trade bill. Uh, it could be a difficult one for the government uh, if there is a vote on staying in a customs union. If the government loses, you might be out of a job. Well, the trade bill is there to ensure continuity um, of our current trading arrangements. It also is there to ensure that we have uh, the ability to set up a trade remedies body to defend things like our steel industry or our ceramics industry. Uh, people who play games with this need to understand the consequences would be a disruption to our trade and an inability for us to defend parts of our industry against uh, dumping from places like China. Um, before they start to play parliamentary games, they should think about the consequences for real British jobs. Is that a message to some of your own backbenchers as well? It's a message to everybody who will be voting on that bill.